So, Apple's iPod. It's had a long and extensive life, and now that that history's finally come to an end with the discontinuation of the last model of iPod, the iPod Touch, I think it's finally time to take a look back on the history of the iPod. So let's start historying, I guess. Apple's first generation of iPod was released in 2001, but let's take a step further back, shall we? Steve Jobs was fired over a disagreement over pricing for the Macintosh in 1985. Steve Jobs then created two new companies, Pixar and Next, neither of which are relevant to this video, but I figured it'd be nice to know. Without Jobs' direction, Apple was digging themselves into a large hole of debt and had a pile of neat products that no one really wanted. With Jobs' eventual return to Apple, he ended up canceling nearly all projects that were in development, and after the iMac was a huge success, they started looking at other possibilities for iProducts. So when a former Philips employee named Tony Fidel approached Apple with the idea of a portable music player that would be a platform to legally sell music, he was hired almost immediately. Fidel's idea had actually been rejected by many companies before Apple finally took him up on the idea. He was given a team of 30 employees and not much development time to start with. So in that time, he partnered with a company called Portal Player, an OEM company for MP3 players, to help with the software and low-level design. While Apple worked on the physical design and user interface, adding the well-known click wheel to the mix. After around eight months after the project started development, it was finally released in 2001 as the iPod, with a slogan of 1,000 songs in your pocket. Looking back, it was suspected that the iPod wasn't really complete in its first generation. It only worked with the Mac, which instantly cut the user base down significantly because, you know, at the time not many people owned a Mac. But with its great user interface and, you know, the ability to hold 1,000 songs in your pocket, it was at least a bucket list item for most people. Apple knew that there were things missing, and so almost immediately they started improving upon the original design by doubling the available storage, adding Windows support, and tying up some other loose ends. This second generation iPod, which is physically almost identical to the first generation, was released in 2002. The third generation iPod was a ridiculous design change, I, but I think it was in a good way. It moved the iPod forward in a way that not many people expected. It removed all physical buttons and had a capacitive touch interface for the touch wheel and red backlit control buttons that were located below the screen. This idea was crazy in a good way. Although the red backlit buttons definitely had an impact on battery life, the capacitive click wheel was a very interesting innovation that basically impacted most future iPod models. It's even still alive today in the new Apple TV Siri remote. Apple released the fourth generation iPod in April 2003. It had a similar capacitive touch interface to the iPod third generation, however it moved the control buttons to the corners of the click wheel, almost like a D-pad. It also had a revision released later that allowed the screen to show color visuals. This was named the iPod Photo. At this point, the iPod was getting a little boring. It was all the same rectangle with a click wheel and buttons and a screen and yada yada yada. It really hadn't changed form factor much. So someone probably said, man, I wish my iPod was slightly less wide, had rounded edges and fun colors. Well, in early 2004, that one person got their wish with the iPod Mini. The iPod Mini only lasted for two revisions, so it didn't even get a real version upgrade. And a little over a year after it was introduced, it was discontinued and replaced by the iPod Nano in 2005, which offered the fourth generation's colored screen and most interface features while using flash storage and being crammed in an absolutely minuscule aluminum case. So what comes next? Also released in 2005 were the iPod Shuffle, an iPod with no click wheel, although its interface resembled one, no screen, and an even tinier form factor. This is how the iPod reached more people, by offering only the core features and for the first time coming at below $100. Well, I mean, I guess it was $99.99. .99. In 2005, Apple also released the iPod Video, or the iPod 5th generation. This was the first iPod capable of playing videos, and this is actually the model that I Bluetooth modded in this video. With the 6th generation of iPod, it was now called the iPod Classic, as there were multiple other variations of the iPod, like the iPod Nano, Shuffle, and eventually the Touch. So Apple really didn't focus much on the iPod Classic after the 6th generation. They came out with the 7th generation, but it wasn't much different. However, the iPod Nano was receiving some major attention. With 7 whole generations of the thing, I think it was the most appealing iPod for most people, other than the iPod Touch. 
first generation iPod Nano was held in that polycarbonate plastic case, just like the iPod fifth generation. The iPod Nano second generation is what I have and what was held in that tiny little aluminum case. The iPod third generation added the ability to play video and was in more of a square form factor. The iPod fourth generation w went back to the taller form factor and had a wider screen for playing video. The iPod fifth generation actually added a camera and microphone to the mix. Oh yeah, iPod Nano camera, woo, plant. Yeah, look at that plant, it's a pretty cool plant, isn't it? Woo! The iPod Nano 6th generation ditched that all together and went, went for a more Apple Watch-esque design. And the iPod Nano 7th generation was almost like a little tiny iPod touch. But let's not forget the beginning of the end. Yeah, the iPod Touch started kind of killing the rest of the iPod line when it first came out. It was basically an iPhone, which was new at the time, but without cellular capabilities, so why would anyone want an iPod Nano Classic or anything else? Because this iPod was just an iPhone. It wasn't even a dedicated music player, it could do other things as well, and so that led to the iPod Touch being more popular and then eventually just being replaced by the iPhone. I really do miss the idea of a dedicated music player made by Apple though. I wish they would reconsider, but I know they would never will. So with that little bit of sadness out of the way, it's time to conclude this video and in turn conclude the history of the iPod. We started with the original iPod, then the iPod Mini, Nano, Shuffle, and eventually the Touch, which kind of just killed everything off. Well, I'm gonna have to kill this video off too, because it's getting kinda long, so thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.